Um, first up uh, this afternoon, um, Peter Turchin, um, who had a paper in <laughs> Nature, was it, about a month ago, on titled Clear, Clear Metrics? Clear Dynamics. And uh, Peter's professor of ecology and mathematics at the University of Connecticut. And he works on um, an attempt to discover general principles to explain the functioning dynamics of historical societies. And I think he has something to say about flourishing of societies and, and how, to, how to do that. So Peter Turchin. Um, is there a science of history? I'm not questioning the professional competence of historians, obviously. History has matured as a wonderful descriptive discipline. But what historians don't seem to do a lot of is proposing general theories and testing them. Now, the situation is uh, in history that hypotheses multiply, but they are never rejected. So, for example, for uh, the question that concerns many historians, why did the Roman Empire f uh, fall, right? Uh, one German historian counted there is over 200 hypotheses, all right? And none of them has, has been rejected. It's just like in physics, you would still live with theories of phlogiston or in uh, biology with Lamarckianism, right? Uh, in history, uh, this process of winnowing out uh, bad theories in favor of good theories doesn't seem to occur. So what I would like to do is to change this uh, state of affairs. I think that we need to uh, develop general uh, theories about the long-term dynamics of societies. By the way, many historians um, don't believe that there are, that general theories in history are even possible. So as um, Roger mentioned, I argued this in a recent piece in Nature where I proposed that uh, we don't uh, necessarily try to supplant history because history is wonderful and we need more of it, but perhaps we need the scientific uh, side of history, and I propose to call it Clio Dynamics. Clio, of course, is the muse of history, and dynamics is the study of uh, temporal processes with the emphasis on mechanisms. But that's a very big subject, right? So today, in the few minutes that I have here, I would like to raise uh, three issues. First, I want to talk about political instability. Second, I want to ask why states fail and why they don't. And third is I want to raise the issue of cooperation. So what do I mean by political instability? Essentially, it's lethal collective violence occurring within societies and or states. So what I'm doing here, I'm excluding interstate warfare. I'm focusing on collective violence, but within states, within societies. And this, um, uh, political stability is a general term, but it can range from fairly minor events, such as a ri an urban riot in which just a few people uh, get killed, to a full-scale civil war. Now, why do we need to study uh, political instability? Well, there is here, there is, here is one statistic. Since the end of the Cold War, internal wars killed 10 times, roughly 10 times as many people as uh, interstate wars, all right? Political instability is a source of massive human misery. Now, the argument I would make is that this is our society devotes a fair amount of resources, not as much as many of us here wish, but still to medical science and to environmental sciences. And that makes sense because we, we care deeply about the health of individuals and the health of ecosystems we live in. But how come we spend so pathetically small amount on social science? Don't we care about the health of social systems that we inhabit? Well, I think that we um, can think of instability as a social disease. It's really a result of uh, processes that cause social dissolution, state weakness, or even state failure. Failed states, that's where the majority of uh, horrible civil wars, genocides, and other types of political instability events take place. So what I would like to do is actually turn around the question uh, about what causes instability, and let's turn around and think about what causes 
uh, strong and just states and cohesive societies? And are there general principles that we can identify by studying history? The reason we cannot really use sociology of here and now because um, research has shown that political instability is a slow variable. It tends to wax and wane over time scales of decades or even human generations. So uh, in order to understand why in a particular place, in a particular time, we have an outbreak of civil war, it's not enough to know what's happening there now, we need to know the history. So that's why we need not just social science, we need historical social science. Now this brings me to the topic of, a major topic of my research. You can call it the puzzle of empires. Let's think about historical states. And if you, th if you encounter, there has been hundreds of books that historians and other social thinkers have written on empires, but most of them focus on the decline and fall of empires, as, as of course the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. But um, I think a much more challenging question is how is it possible for such huge territorial states to exist in the first place? What are the social forces that held together across history huge societies that controlled millions of square kilometers and populations of tens or, or even hundreds of millions of people? That's, that's, a, that's what I would call the puzzle of empire. Now, obviously, that question has concerned um, thinkers over the ages. I won't go through the list of a number of um, theories that have been, and it's an incomplete list here because I don't have time. Let me just state boldly without support for now that my favor, favorite uh, theory is the theory of multi-level selection which has been uh, advocated by such people whose names have been already mentioned today, like David Sloan Wilson, uh, Rob Boyd, Pete Richardson, Sam Bowles, and uh, many others. So um, the key thing is cooperation. Cooperation is really the glue that, uh, that holds societies together. And now this seems strange, right? We are talking about historical empires. And we think usually of them as engines of coercion uh, naked economic interest and things like that. And that's all true. Empires have done a lot of coercion and uh, self-interest has been involved. But again, and I will state it boldly because I don't have time to justify my belief. But essentially, without that extra glue of cooperation, historical societies, historical empires could not exist. Yes, uh, there was coercion and um, economic self-interest, but you also need an extra something in order for those societies to, to have existed. And this is very, has been uh, recently stated by one of the best American sociologists, Randall Collins. He calls it the non-obvious sociological insight. But of course, the idea uh, has roots uh, back to the work of Emile Durkheim and the great Arab, Arab thinker Ibn Khaldun, who proposed the term asabiya for this uh, ability for of, uh, groups of people to act in a concerted manner. So how can you study the processes responsible for social integration and dissolution, these two sides of the, the dynamical process that uh, uh, may explain why states uh, and societies grow cohesive and strong and also why they break apart and fall into instability. I just um, want to throw just one thing here. Uh, the general idea here is that history is rife with empirical patterns. And where you have repeated empirical patterns, there is a suggestion that there might be some general principles and mechanisms underlying them. Since the time is limited, I'll just throw one such uh, interesting observation here. What I'm doing here is I'm plotting so this x-axis is time, starting uh, in the uh, beginning of the third millennium BC and up to 1800, so from 28 BC to 1800 of the common era. And on the y-axis, I am plotting the territorial extent of the largest existing state at that particular point in time, all right? Notice that the scale is logarithmic. So we see here, 
up to and the beginning of the first millennium BC, the social scale of integration, the maximum scale of social integration has gradually increased, but it had, very, it had a lot of difficulty breaking through this uh, threshold of one million squared kilometers. And then between 800 and 200 BC, suddenly there was this breakthrough and the social scale of integration has increased by an order of magnitude. This is when we, we see the first traditional empires. Of, the, the first one is, of course, the Achaemenid Persian, uh, Persia, and then we have the Roman Empire and uh, the Chinese Empire under the Han Dynasty, and so on and so forth. What is uh, interesting is that this period, 800 to 200 BC, is precisely what Carl Jaspers has called the Axial Age. This is the age, this is the time when a number of world religions and philosophies has been, uh, well, has arrived or has evolved. So here's just one uh, idea as a hypothesis. What if uh, that's not just a coincidence and actually there is uh, evidence that it is not a coincidence. <clears throat> It is, it, I think I can argue that religion, the, uh, especially those world religions that um, evolved during the Axial Age, they can be thought of as integrative ideologies. What they did, they enabled cooperation at a very large social scale. They allowed different ethnic groups to actually live within one uh, state. And here, is, here are some uh, examples of um, th such uh, religions. And in fact, when we start thinking of looking at them, we see that what's important here is not really religion in a sense of supernatural, but religion as, uh, or ideology as an integrative force. Stoicism, for example, the ideology that motivated Romans to build their great empire is really doesn't have much of a supernatural uh, component. Non neither does Confucianism. Buddhism, of course, is an atheistic religion. At least originally, Buddha actually argued against gods. And only monotheism, such as uh, Judaism and its offshoots, uh, is, uh, is a supernatural religion in the full sense of the word. So I think that in this um, argument about the value of religion, um, it needs to be separated into two aspects. Uh, I'm not addressing the supernatural part, but if we want to think about the adaptive value of religion, we should consider its integrative, uh, uh, integrative part. And I don't know if people see it, but the, just think about the origin. What does religion mean? In Latin, religio is a bond. Religiones were the bonds that held the Roman society together. So even in the name religion, you have that, um, mm, uh, the origin, uh, original meaning of the word present. Okay, just to conclude, I really um, am not proposing here any answers or solutions. What I'm doing is I'm raising, I'm raising questions. First of all, I would like to us to focus more on political instability as a source of massive human misery. How do we solve this problem? That's a big question. Secondly, I argue that a strong and just state is possible only on the basis of a well-integrated society. So what are the causes of social integration versus dissolution? And thirdly, I argue that cooperation is the key, the critical social glue that holds societies together. So what mechanisms co uh, cause it to wax versus wane? And um, I realize that it's maybe not as satisfactory just to raise this question. So I do have some partial and, in a partial and tentative answers. And so here we come to the inevitable uh, self-promotion part. Uh, in particular, there are two books. Um, Historical Dynamics is a technical book. It has mathematical models. Um, statistical analysis of databases and things like that, all right? So if you are interested in trying to get some glimpse of my thinking in a more gentle way, 
then I suggest you to check War and Peace in the War, which is a popular uh, book which presents my ideas. But the science is there. I mean, the hard uh, science uh, is uh, uh, there. Those, again, just, uh, just uh, these are not, uh, by, I don't pretend to any final uh, answers here. Um, it's really an exciting area where there is a lot to do. Thank you.